on the morning of August 12, 2000, during the Russian Navy's summer naval exercises in the Barents Sea, the supposedly unsinkable Oscar II-class submarine Kursk disappeared while conducting a practice torpedo launch. The submarine, manned by a seasoned crew of 118 professional sailors, had been authorised to launch two dummy torpedoes at the Admiral Kuznetsov aircraft carrier. However, at 11.29 a.m., an explosion occurred, followed by a second one just two minutes later, sending shockwaves across the globe. The international community swiftly offered assistance, but the Russian authorities initially refused aid. While the chances of rescuing any survivors were slim, the negligence of an unorganized navy and a faltering government exacerbated the tragedy, sealing the fate of the Kursk and her crew. It wasn't until years later that the truth behind the events of that fateful morning was revealed, casting a shadow of mourning and fatigue over the entire incident. During the Cold War, one of the Soviet Union's paramount concerns revolved around the threat posed by American aircraft carriers. These formidable vessels had the capability to launch thermonuclear airstrikes on Soviet territory and track down the Soviet nuclear ballistic missile fleet. In response, the USSR allocated significant resources to develop specialized weapons capable of countering these threats. The culmination of this effort was the Project 949A anti-class nuclear-powered cruise missile submarines, designated Oscar II under NATO terminology. Powered by two OK-650 nuclear reactors, these submarines boasted an impressive 97,990 horsepower, enabling them to reach a top speed of 33 knots underwater. With dimensions measuring 508 feet in length, approximately 60 feet in beam, and a displacement of 19,400 tons, twice that of a destroyer, they were formidable vessels. Each Oscar II submarine could carry up to 24 P-700 granite missiles, each roughly the size of a small airplane. These 33-foot-long missiles, weighing 15,400 pounds, could achieve a top speed of Mach 1.6 and had a range of 388 miles. Equipped with satellite guidance systems, these missiles were capable of delivering either a conventional high-explosive warhead or a devastating 500 kiloton nuclear warhead. Despite initial plans for 20 Oscar-class submarines, only 13 were constructed by the end of the Cold War, including both Oscar I and Oscar II variants. K-141 Kursk, one of the last Ante-class submarines laid down, was completed in 1994, symbolizing the pinnacle of late Soviet nuclear submarine design. Kursk quickly earned a reputation as one of the most formidable vessels in the Russian Navy, featuring a double hull, an outer layer of 0.3 inches, and an inner layer of 2 inches of steel plate separated by a gap of 3 to 7 feet. Kursk was deemed virtually unsinkable. With its inner hull, segmented into nine watertight compartments. It was designed to withstand direct torpedo attacks. Twice the size of a jumbo jet and three times larger than the largest submarine in the US Navy, Kursk became a source of pride for the Russian Navy, solidifying its status as the largest attack submarine in the world. However, following the dissolution of the USSR, the Russian Navy faced severe budget cuts impacting maintenance efforts on its assets. Consequently, many submarines, including once proud vessels like Kursk, began to fall into disrepair. In a significant display of military prowess on August 12, 2000, dozens of vessels participated in a major naval exercise, marking the first such event after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Among the fleet were notable vessels like the Kursk submarine, the Admiral Kuznetsov carrier and the Pyotr Veliki battlecruiser. Converging in the Barents Sea above the Arctic Circle, they engaged in the Summer X exercise. Kursk had recently garnered praise for its exceptional performance, with its crew being hailed as the finest submarine crew in the entire Northern Fleet. Remarkably, it was one of the few submarines authorised to maintain a combat-ready status at all times equipped with a full complement of conventional combat weapons. 
operated by 118 proficient sailors and armed with granite missiles and torpedoes, the K-141 was tasked with executing a simulated attack. Requesting permission to conduct a torpedo training launch, Kursk was granted clearance. Subsequently, the missile room crew loaded a Type 65 torpedo, nicknamed Tolstoya, or Fat Girl, into tube number four on the starboard side. Devoid of its warhead, the torpedo measured 35 feet in length and weighed approximately five tons. Suddenly, at 11.29 a.m., a colossal underwater explosion registered on the Norwegian seismic array and various monitoring stations worldwide. Merely two minutes later, a second, even more powerful blast reverberated through the exercise area. This explosion equated to a 4.2 magnitude earthquake on the Richter scale, or the force of two to three tons of TNT. The second explosion, 250 times stronger than the first, sent shockwaves all the way to Alaska. While the crew aboard the fellow submarine Corellia initially assumed the explosions were part of the exercise, those aboard the battle cruiser detected a hydroacoustic signal and felt their hull shudder instead of the anticipated launch. Veliki immediately reported the incident to headquarters, but the message went unheeded. Compounding the situation, seismic data indicated that the explosions had occurred at the same depth as the seabed, prompting a state of emergency. By 1.30 p.m., there was still no contact with Kursk, and her allotted practice time had elapsed. On board the Pyotr Veliki, Fleet Commander Admiral Vilenchuk Alexeyevich Popov remained initially unconcerned, attributing the lack of communication to common failures. Nevertheless, a helicopter and a rescue ship were dispatched to search for the missing submarine to no avail. An aircraft was also mobilized at 5 p.m. When Kursk failed to complete a scheduled communication check an hour later, the Northern Fleet grew increasingly apprehensive. However, it wasn't until 10.30 p.m. that a state of emergency was declared and the exercise was halted. The vessels of the Northern Fleet, along with their 3,000 sailors, then commenced a search and rescue operation. The international community promptly offered assistance with the United States, Britain, France, Norway and other nations extending aid to the Russian government. The US even offered to deploy a deep submergence rescue vehicle, but Russian officials, remaining insular, declined external assistance. Following the initial explosions, a prolonged period of confusion, miscommunication and bureaucratic disputes ensued. Initially, the Navy sought to downplay the incident. Admiral Popov informed Defence Minister Igor Sergei of the incident late on Saturday night, but President Vladimir Putin, who was on vacation, was not notified until Sunday morning. Advised to remain on vacation, this decision risked tarnishing his public image. Meanwhile, Admiral Popov briefed reporters on the naval exercise's purported success despite growing rumours circulating among the families of the missing crew who censored that something was amiss. At the small base in Vidyavo, wives and families exchanged fragmentary information while trying to dispel the worst fears, buoyed by the belief in Kursk's supposed unsinkability. As futile efforts to locate the wreckage persisted, an official announcement about the accident was finally made on Monday the 14th, two days after the explosions. Authorities initially attributed the incident to minor technical difficulties, claiming that the submarine had descended to the ocean floor, but reassuring the public that contact had been established with the crew, who were receiving air and power. Various explanations were put forth to account for the accident. Admiral Vladimir Kuryadov, commander-in-chief of the Russian Navy, suggested an external collision while others speculated about a collision with a NATO submarine. Vice Premier Ilya Klebanov proposed the possibility of Kursk striking a World War II mine. However, none of these explanations proved accurate and the truth remained elusive for some time. A week after the tragedy, 
Putin finally acknowledged the need for assistance and authorised British and Norwegian experts to join the rescue efforts. Despite knowing the slim chances of finding survivors, divers felt disheartened upon discovering the flooded rescue trunk. Upon cutting through the hull, they found only dust, ashes and severely burned human remains. On August 21st, the fate of the Kursk and her 118 sailors was publicly announced in a television broadcast, where April Popov addressed the audience, expressing remorse. Forgive me for not bringing back your boys. August 23rd was declared an official day of mourning, and three days later, Putin posthumously awarded the title of Hero of Russia to the submarine's commander, Gennady Lyachin, and the Order of Courage to the 117 lost sailors. Kursk remained on the sea floor until September 26, 2001, when it was raised to continue investigations. Unfortunately, the front hull had to be left behind, resulting in the loss of crucial evidence. The truth behind the incident emerged in the summer of 2002. An old torpedo had leaked hydrogen peroxide, a fuel banned by the British decades prior. Faulty welding on the malfunctioning torpedo led to the initial explosion, igniting the remaining ammunition on board. Other contributing factors included a disabled rescue buoy, missed inspection checks, and mishandling of delicate equipment. Moreover, systemic incompetence and neglect left 23 survivors stranded in the ninth compartment. Despite their efforts to survive, they ultimately succumbed to a chemical explosion and flash fire, consuming the remaining oxygen. Russian Navy officials were held accountable for the incompetent response, resulting in the removal, firing or transfer of several individuals. This tragedy served as a harsh lesson for Russia, prompting the Defence Ministry to initiate an extensive modernisation of the Navy and the renewal of decrepit vessels, though it took a decade for these measures to be fully implemented. Thank you for watching.